Okay, in this video, I'm going to think aloud as I complete the practice exam for part one of the final exam. So this part of the exam covers material from unit one, mods one to two, so the definitions of arguments and statements and where we're introduced to the standards for evaluating arguments. And then it's going to dovetail into unit two, mods one through four. That's the whole logic unit. It contains 28 five-point questions and 10 one-point questions. In this practice version, these one-point questions are identified with a star. And another thing to know about these one-point questions is that they're generally going to be pretty much identical on the practice exam and the final exam. The whole thing is worth a total of 150 points, and you'll have 90 minutes for this portion of the exam. The best way to study is to complete this on your own. Sit down in an exam-like uh, situation, set a timer, and try to complete the whole thing without looking at any resources. And then your task here is to figure out where exactly you should focus your efforts when you start studying by sort of gauging what you already know and what you don't. The next best thing is to at least have the exam available for you to take and pause this video and answer every question on your own before listening to me answer and think aloud as I answer each question. Okay, question number one. Best definition of an argument. Pause, answer on your own for all of these questions. Hopefully the clear answer by this point is B. This is crucial, that this is what we mean by argument for the whole class. These are other things we mean by argument outside of this class, and it's a perfectly good way to use the word, but it's important that we have our terms clear for the context of this class, and this is the only thing we have meant by argument in this class. Which of the following is the best definition of a proposition or statement? And we're primarily using the word statement. Pause it, answer it on your own. Again, these are all perfectly good ways to use the word statement in ordinary discourse, but in the context of this class, we specifically mean the kind of thing that's either true or false. So let's determine for each of these six little sentences whether it contains an argument or a statement. The number one thing you should be looking for when distinguishing between a statement and an argument is indicator words. So I've marked on the side of each of these questions where this kind of question was introduced. So if you go back to study, you know which modules to take a look at. But this one is also, I think maybe it's 1.3, where we talked about indicator words. The number one way to identify whether or not something is an argument is to identify indicator words. Not every argument uses indicator words, but that's a good place to start. What makes a thing an argument is that reasons are being given, right? So this, a set of statements such that one is the conclusion, the others are supposed to provide support. The essential thing an argument has is reasons. So if you see reasons for believing something, it's an argument. So one, sleep is crucial for memory function, so you should be sure to get at least eight hours. I see a conclusion indicator word. The claim is you should get at least eight hours of sleep. Why? For what reason? It's crucial for memory function. This tells us that this is an argument. You ought to get at least eight hours of sleep because memory depends on sleep. Again, we're being given a reason. Because is a reason indicator word. It tells us this is the reason. For what? Why you should get eight hours of sleep. Reason. Memory. So again, this one is an argument. If you want to improve your memory, you should get more sleep. This is a conditional statement. You might remember that 
conditional statements are tricky. We often imply more than we literally say when we make conditional statements, but we're going to treat them literally here. A conditional statement is not an argument. It is a statement. It tells you that if you want to improve your memory, you should get more sleep. What would the conclusion be? It's not you should get more sleep. This is just if you want to get your memory, then you should get more sleep or if you want to improve. Now, it might be implied that and you do want to improve your memory and so you should get more sleep where both the premise and the conclusion are implicit. But what we've got here, this would just be a statement, a premise in the reasoning. So conditional statements themselves are not literally arguments. Pulling an all-nighter is often counterproductive. Not getting enough sleep can negatively affect your memory and increase your stress levels, which can affect exam performance. All right, what do we think of this one? It's long, so and it's more than one sentence, so that's one reason to think maybe there's some reasoning going on. But the number one thing we're looking for is, are we given reasons to believe something? If it's an argument, there should be a conclusion and there should be reasons. This one doesn't have any indicator words, but this is the conclusion. Pulling an all-nighter is counterproductive. Why? Reasons. Not getting enough sleep will negatively affect your memory, increase your stress levels, and that will in turn affect your exam performance. That's why reasons pulling an all-nighter is counterproductive. So that's going to be an argument. Cognitive performance can be significantly impaired by not getting enough sleep, eating junk food, and high stress levels. What is this one? This is just a statement about things that affect your cognitive performance and specifically impair it. You should get plenty of sleep, eat nutritious meals and snacks, and exercise. What do you think? Statement or argument? Many students are inclined to pick argument because this sounds like an opinion. It's got this you should. It sounds like an opinion. But this is a statement. Why? Because the number one thing that matters is are reasons being given. You should get plenty of sleep, blah, blah, blah. Why? Are we given reasons? No. So it is a statement. Now it sounds like an argument to our ears because this is the kind of thing that is the conclusion of an argument, right? So oftentimes we associate the conclusion of an argument with what an argument is, but technically this is just a statement, the statement that will be listed as the conclusion. Okay, so these were all definitions of argument and statement. Now we're moving into material from Unit 1, Mod 2, Standards, where we start to think about evaluating arguments as good or bad. So which of the following are basic criteria for evaluating arguments? Any arguments. Any argument at all. Deductive, inductive, whatever. What are the basic criteria? It's about support. You've been given reasons. Those reasons support the conclusion. And they're true. Those are the only two criteria. Okay, let's fill in the blanks. So there's two kinds of arguments. Arguments that meet deductive standards or are fit to be held to deductive standards and arguments that are fit to be held to inductive standards. Let's focus on the deductive arguments. Of the arguments we hold to deductive standards, some will meet them. The premises will guarantee the conclusion and some won't. And of those arguments where the premises, if they are true, guarantee the conclusion, some of those will have premises that are actually true. And similarly for inductive arguments. Some arguments held to this standard will meet it. 
the premises, if true, will make the conclusion likely to be true. And some won't. And of the arguments where the premises support the conclusion, some of those will have premises that are actually true. Okay, then we've got definitions. If the premises are or were true, they do or would guarantee that the conclusion is true. So this is about the relationship between the premises and conclusion. The support relationship is a guarantee relationship. That is the definition of validity. If the premises are or were true, they do or would make it likely that the conclusion is true. That's the definition of a strong support relationship, a strong inference. A strong argument, so an argument with a strong inference that has true premises, that is cogent, and a valid argument with true premises, so an argument whose premises guarantee the conclusion and those premises are actually true, that is sound. Okay, which of the following are true of valid deductive arguments? Okay, so here we're still in Unit 1, Mod 2, and we've got conceptual questions. So if you're struggling with these, you can find the conceptual questions in the practice materials for this unit. There are quizlets with conceptual questions. There's worksheets with conceptual questions, and you've got some of these in your homework exercises. Okay, but these are essentially just definitional. So which of the following are true of valid deductive arguments? If the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Yes, that is the core definition. It is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. That's basically another way of just stating the definition. And this is the way of stating the definition that we really emphasized in the rest of the logic unit in the counterexamples module and beyond. Okay, how about if the conclusion is false, then at least one premise must be false. So let's sort of just start with these two. What do they say? Let's say that I've got a true premise, true premise, true premise, and conclusion. A says, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must also be true. So the support relationship, this arrow, guarantees that if these are true, then this has to be true. The one thing that validity promises will never happen, the one thing that can never happen with a valid argument is true premises and a false conclusion. So let's focus on this case. This is the thing that validity says you can never have this, right? So A says, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So if these are true, this would have to be true because this TF case can never happen. It's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion is false. So again, this is the thing that can never happen. So now let's look at C. If the conclusion is false, then at least one premise must be false. So it, let's assume the conclusion is false. Well, if all the premises were true, then this happened, but this can never happen. That's what validity says. So if this is false, then one of these has to be false because this can never happen when an argument is valid. So this is going to be true of valid arguments as well. How about if the premises are false, the conclusion must be false? Well, that's saying, if the premises are false, then this has to be true. If this wasn't true, you would get this. But that's fine. You can have a valid argument with false premises and a false conclusion. You can have a valid argument with false premises and a true conclusion. The one thing you can never have is true premises and a false conclusion. So this one's fine. Not as in it's correct, as in a valid argument can have these things. So how about E, the premises and conclusion must all be true? 
Not required. A valid argument does not require premises and conclusion are all true. All that's true of valid arguments is this can never happen. That's it. Okay, which of the following is the best definition of a counterexample? We're moving into Unit 2, Mod 1 here. The best definition of a counterexample. Just like with argument and statement, some of these are ways that we use counterexample in other contexts, and that's fine in those contexts, but we mean something super specific. What do we mean when we use the word counterexample? A counterexample is an example that demonstrates that an argument is invalid. A counterexample is a scenario in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false. And again, the one thing that can never happen in a valid argument is true premises and a false conclusion. So if you can come up with a scenario where this happens, a counterexample, that shows an argument is invalid. So... A counterexample is an example that demonstrates that an argument is invalid. Example, scenario, case, all of those words are synonymous. So which of the following are true? An example in which the premises and conclusion are all true demonstrates that an argument is valid. No, that's not true. We don't care about the premises and conclusion all being true. The only thing we care about is this can never happen. Just like love is never having to say you're sorry, which sounds not true. Uh, validity is never having to have true premises and a false conclusion. That's all it promises. Okay, so B. An example in which the conclusion is true demonstrates that an argument is valid. No, we don't care about the conclusion being true. We don't care about the premises and the conclusion being true. We only care that the premises, it's never the case that the premises are true and the conclusion is false. An example in which the premises and conclusion are all false demonstrates that an argument is invalid. Nope. Don't care about that case either. An example in which the premises are all true and the conclusion is false demonstrates that an argument is invalid. Yes, 100%. It shows that this can happen, and that means the argument's not valid. An example in which the conclusion is false demonstrates that an argument is invalid. No. Okay, so let's use the counterexample method to evaluate the following argument. Some Eagletonians ride so segways. Ron Dunn is an Eagletonian. Therefore, Ron Dunn rides a Segway. So the counterexample method is try to come up with an example where the premises are all true and the conclusion is false. So we need to make it true that some Eagletonians ride Segways. So we're setting up a scenario. Imagine a world, a case, a scenario, an example where some Eagletonian, we need to make the premises true, so some Eagletonians really do ride segways, and Ron Dunn is a resident of Eagleton. But, we need to make the conclusion false. But, Ron doesn't ride a segway. Now what we should do to go beyond this, we've, we've come up with a scenario, we've basically just said premises are true and the conclusion is false. But just to make sure that it makes sense, that these things are coherent together, try to explain like how this all works, right? Why is it that these can be true even though this is false? Well, the point here is that some Eagletonians ride segways, but not all. Right? So... In order to make this true, we just need some, and we can let Ron Dunn be one of the non-Segway-riding Eagletonians. 
And that is enough to make the premises true and the conclusion false. And it shows that the fact that these are true doesn't imply that this must also be true. And so the argument is not valid. And no, we don't care about what's actually true or false at all. Just what's true if these are true. And this doesn't follow. And that is what pointing out this shows. Now, this is just the scenario. So we could fully explain uh, because we are able to construct a counterexample, a case in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false, the argument is invalid. You could even go further and give the definition of validity, but just looking for the basics here. Okay, so now we're moving into unit 2 mod 2 translations. So I'm going to pause and start a new video for translations specifically.